All right, welcome Blazers. Uh, this is the town hall for students and family members. Um, we welcome you this evening. You're gonna hear from our leaders here at UAB. Um, you'll hear about testing options. You'll hear about vaccine information and the latest on COVID. Um, you'll hear from our provost that's gonna give an overview of um, just the academics and how the semester is gonna look. Um, so we welcome you. Uh, just some housekeeping notes here. Uh, we will be, we are recording this session. Um, if you wanna go back and look at the content, we will have it up on UAB's YouTube so you can check afterwards. Um, at the end of the session, if we have time, we'll take some of your questions. Um, questions that we won't be able to get to if we run out of time will be um, answered or addressed um, in your in the next kind of upcoming green mail, either the next one or the, the one following. So um, students look and open your green mail. So with that, I'd like to introduce the president of UAB, uh, Dr. Ray Watts. Thank you, Rosie. <clears throat> Welcome everyone. We're excited to start the spring semester this week. We're so glad to have you back engaged in your educational activities, which we want to be nothing short of superlative. But at the same time, obviously our focus will also be on your safety and your good health. And we wanna to continue to do everything we can to keep our campus as one of the safest places, not just in our community, but in the country. So we are uh, excited to have the advent of the vaccines. We're in the very, very beginning. There's optimism for the months to come, but at the current time, it's critically important that we continue the known safety measures that we know work and will prevent the spread of virus among our UAB community. And those are, as you know too well, facial masking, social distancing, hand hygiene, and not gathering in groups, certainly not in groups without these safety measures. So we've worked the program tonight to try to address the concerns and interests that you have. We will, if possible, and hopefully we'll have the time to address some questions. But as Rosie said, we'll answer all of your questions uh, with written responses if we don't get to address them tonight. Tonight's speakers have been chosen to be um, experts in the topic. And with that, I think what I'll do is stop and pass the podium to our Vice President for Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, Dr. Paulette Dilworth. Paulette. Thank you, Dr. Watts. Good evening, Blazers. Welcome back. I'm Paulette Dilworth, and I'm Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion here at UAB. As we reflect on the year 2020 and the beginning of 2021, what comes into focus is a host of exhausting and unsettling moments in our nation's history, a viral pandemic, racial tensions, riots, and violence. These events harken back to 1968, which has been defined as one of the most turbulent years in US history. Blazers, at UAB every day, we will continue to live out our shared values, our nation's core principles, such as, such as civility, human decency, respect, and equal rights. As an institution of higher learning, we should all commit ourselves to promote these values on campus and in our communities. We must be united and stand to condemn social injustices that, and seek peaceful common ground. That is the Blazer way. And that is how we talk, walk our talk. So what do we do? What actions can we take? Our principles only become meaningful when they are followed up with action. Our university strategic plan, forging the future, the strategic diversity, diversity plan, leading with bold vision and bold moves, takes the values one step further to actionable priorities and accountability. Let's all work together to ensure that UAB continues on a path to be a model for just, inclusive, and equitable community that prepares the next generation to lead in a new and better world. Over the next few months, the Office of the Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion will continue to work in collaboration with the Office of Student Multicultural Programs and Services, the Institute for Human Rights, and other units across UAB, across the UAB enterprise to build on the momentum of our longstanding efforts to work for sustainable transformation on our campus and in our communities. We hope you will join us in those efforts. Many resources and programming information 
are available on the Office of Diversity and Equ Inclusion's website, including information about Community Month, which offers lectures, cultural programs, film screenings, opportunities for departments to showcase their efforts and critical dialogues. Our next critical conversation, a virtual event, is scheduled for Tuesday, January 26 at 6 p.m. The topic is post-election America, what's next for our communities? In this session, the year 2020 is introduced as challenges and opportunities that tested the strength of our institutions and our social systems. The 2020 presidential race produced the biggest turnout of voters in the history of US elections. Our discussion will explore community engagement, education, economics, healthcare equity, attempting to answer the question, what's next and how do we heal? We hope you will join us in our many efforts. Thank you and go Blazers. But now turn the mic over to Tyler Hong. Tyler. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to spring term 2021. Whether you're stepping back to campus after an extended winter break, or if this is your first time stepping foot on our campus, I'm so ecstatic that our UAB community continues to grow. My name is Tyler Huang, and I currently serve as the student body president of the Undergraduate Student Government Association. Echoing the previous administrators on this call, I want to welcome you all tonight to this student town hall into a brand new semester. 2021 has quickly taken off and the spring term will be picking up at an even faster pace. Our downtown campus is bustling again with eager students and I'm so stoked to hear about all of our success this upcoming term. As a student body, I'm incredibly impressed by our ability to abide by health promoting behaviors outlined by our public health experts here at UAB last semester. However, we must continue to engage in these public health practices to ensure our continual presence on our beautiful campus. It is my belief that we can continue to lead the nation in demonstrating our ability to overcome this pandemic. Though in-person events will stall until February 14th, there are still numerous ways to stay engaged with your friends and your new classmates. Engage, our student hub for all things involvement, can help you get connected in a safe and distanced manner. As we outline our new semester with new classes, assignments, and projects, let us also remember to outline strategies to keep ourselves and our community safe. In closing, I always want to reinforce that the efforts that have been demonstrated by the student body across our campus have not gone unnoticed. Continue to engage yourselves inside and outside of the classroom and rely on your support system as we tackle this new semester. As always, show your blazer spirit and let's conquer this pandemic together. We are a UAB community and everything that we value aligns hand in hand with our UAB creed, the Blazer way. And as your undergraduate student body president, I wanna to continue to strive to advocate on behalf of the student body to address key concerns to enhance the student experience at UAB. Please don't hesitate to reach out and I hope everyone has a remarkable semester. And now I'd like to turn it over to our university provost, Dr. Benoit, as she provides us with some academic updates. Welcome back. Yes, thank you, Tyler. Welcome back, Blazers. I'd like to do just a couple of highlights about the spring 2021 schedule. The first is that classes will be much like they were in the fall, meaning that there will be some in-person classes, some that are hybrid, some remote, some online. So it will look very much like what we experienced in the fall semester. I know some people have asked, you know, why would we be coming back to class. And one of the things that I want to respond to that with is that we follow the advice of our public health and our infectious disease experts. And think about the times that they were right. We were able to do a fall semester together because of your cooperation, because of the safety measures that were put in place. We had advice not to come back after Thanksgiving break. And given the increases after that point in time, that was really good advice for us to follow. And we had advice about spring break. And so we, so many of the things that our experts have told us have really been important in forming our decisions about how to handle the semester going forward. One of the things I also wanted to mention is that there are a lot of resources available to you as a student, particularly technology resources. If you look at the e-learning website, which is going to be in the chat, you'll see all kinds of online resources as well as workshops that are available to you to make sure that you have everything you need to be successful this term. 
I noticed in the question, someone asked about ProctorU and ProctorU is an online testing system. Faculty actually have several options with their assessment tools. ProctorU is one of the ones that gets used pretty frequently. This semester, students will have the opportunity to do practice exams three times before their actual exam to make sure that their computers are set up properly and they won't have technical difficulties. And the other thing I'll mention is that there's an upcoming workshop that is focused on ProctorU for students. And that will be held on February 10th at 5.30 p.m. And if you go to that e-learning website, you'll be able to register for that upcoming workshop. They'll also be recording that. So if that time doesn't work out and you wanna check out that resource, make sure you go back and take a look at that before you take an exam that's coming up. A number of other things are worth um, repeating. One is we will not be doing a spring break. Uh, we uh, had advice from our public health and infectious disease experts. There's a lot more chance of spreading when you go away from campus and come back. But we listened very carefully to our students, to Tyler and to Jasmine and to others about the importance of thinking about mental health. And so we were able to put in two wellness days into the schedule. Those are March 16th and April 14th. And this is a chance to relax, to refresh, to rejuvenate, not only for students, but quite frankly, also for faculty and staff. And so we've asked faculty not to make major assignments on those days, to find alternative ways. They have some instruction, but not on that particular day. So. We'll, we'll be trying that out this semester to try to give some mental health breaks. Uh, because classes uh, for the spring 2021 started eight days later than usual, um, we are able to still finish the term at the same time that we had originally anticipated, uh, as long as we took the spring break out of the schedule. As Tyler indicated, there will not be in-person student events until February 14th because we're in a peak COVID period and we know that a lot of the transmission occurs not in the classroom, the classrooms are actually incredibly safe, but frequently in small groups and especially in small groups when people are not abiding by the other safety protocols like wearing their mask or they take their mask off to eat. Those are places where there's more of a prevalence. And then the last topic I wanna to touch on briefly is commencement. I know there's a great deal of interest about having an in-person commencement. And I will say that we continue to monitor the situation very carefully. We're researching various uh, options that we could do that would be an in-person option. And we will make the decision based upon what the prevalence looks like and making sure that you are safe. We would love to have an in-person commencement, but we need to really make a decision that's based on public health considerations. And with that, I wanna talk just a little bit about testing. One of the things that's so different this term is the testing protocols. They are much more significant than they were in the fall. And again, we use the evidence from the fall to make better decisions about how to do that testing. And I'm gonna turn it over now to Katie Crenshaw who will walk you through the new testing protocols. Thanks so much, Dr. Benoit, and hello, everyone. My name is Katie Crenshaw, and I'm the Chief Risk and Compliance Officer here at UAB, and I have the honor of serving as the chair of the UAB Campus Incident Command Committee. Our committee is responsible for gathering and monitoring data related to UAB's experience with COVID and sharing that with leadership so that informed, data-driven decisions can be made about UAB's ongoing uh, plan for health and safety. Uh, based on our data from the fall semester and recommendations, as Dr. Benoit was saying, from our infectious disease and public health experts, UAB's testing plan for the spring has been enhanced and expanded. Our modified testing plan is designed to address current COVID-19 community trends and to further reduce the risk of transmission on campus. There are four types of free COVID testing for students who are enrolled in face-to-face -face and hybrid courses or otherwise on campus this spring that we wanted to share with you at least in broad strokes this evening. The first is symptomatic testing. Just like in the fall, students who experience COVID symptoms should report those on UAB Health Check. You'll be prompted to complete a more in-depth form for evaluation and follow-up by UAB Student Health Services. So nothing has changed there in terms of fall to spring. The second type of testing is close contact testing. Students who are not symptomatic, who don't have any uh, symptoms related to COVID-19, but who are informed that they have had close contact with a COVID positive individual should also report that exposure on UAB Health Check. After completing the more in-depth form for evaluation by Student Health Services, 
you'll receive a follow-up email instructing you to quarantine for the required 10 days and inviting you to test. This type of close contact testing is offered, offered at the guide safe testing locations and you must have an appointment to be tested. It's important to keep in mind that this testing does not shorten the period of time that's mandated for quarantine by the Alabama Department of Public Health, but it does allow for further contact tracing of known positive cases. Students can leave quarantine for the test and then must return to quarantine thereafter. The third type of testing uh, represents probably the biggest change from the fall. It's called active sentinel testing. Active Sentinel testing offers UAB students in face-to-face -face or hybrid courses, or again, otherwise on campus, an opportunity to test every other week. Students living in the residence halls and registered for certain music and ROTC courses are required to participate when their turn is up. For others, we encourage you to take advantage of this testing resource. Not only does it support your health and the health of your family and friends, but it also helps further protect UAB campus by quickly identifying and isolating asymptomatic positive cases. And to further motivate you, uh, there are also incentives like t-shirts and Starbucks gift cards uh, available for participants, at least while supplies last. Important to point out here that all students on campus this spring are required to register with Verily, UAB's trusted testing partner. This is true even if you're in a voluntary group and do not elect to participate. If you haven't already, visit healthy.verily.com to create your Verily account. After you register, you'll receive an email from Verily notifying you when you're eligible to test and containing the link to set up an appointment at one of the designated campus locations in Blazer Hall Res Life Center or Volker Hall. Days and times vary, so look at that email invitation for additional information or visit the UAB United website for details. Finally, uh, where there may be multiple positive cases in a single location or learning environment, based on our uh, advice from public health officials and, or excuse me, professionals and, and our infectious disease experts, uh, UAB may also recommend for cause or hotspot testing of individuals similar to how we did in the fall. Now, this was a pretty broad overview, and we recognize there could be lots of questions about the testing plan. Uh, so I encourage you to stay tuned uh, to UAB United for updates. There are some great resources there, like these slides and process maps uh, to uh, decode a little bit some of these different categories. And stay tuned to your UAB Green Mail as well, where updates will be posted. With that, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Selwyn Vickers, Senior Vice President for Medicine and Dean for additional comment. Dr. Vickers. Thank you, Katie. Um, I too would wanna welcome the students back and thank you for just the outstanding performance of both academically, but also adhering to public health policies that you as a student body carried out throughout last year. There were so many times on a national level, we were proud of the exemplary behaviors of our students that was evidenced by the data and outcomes that were produced by the efforts you made to both protect your classmates and yourselves by following the public health orders. So thank you again. And therefore we're excited about a new semester, even though there's a tremendous rise in virus cases and deaths, uh, we are, we're, we're really confident that the academic atmosphere that you have created with us is a safe place. Uh, I think you heard from Dr. Benoit that the biggest challenge we have in transmission where it's clinical students uh, or students in our undergrad or graduate environment, it's the behavior in the community and in small groups that really have made, made uh, any differences in transmission or a challenge in transmission. So um, we're confident that because of the behaviors that you all demonstrated in the past and the, um, the procedures we put in, uh, and the lessons we've learned that this semester can be successful. One of those lessons is clearly when you remember, we, we, we started with the goal of really testing everybody on campus coming back in order to reduce, or in our minds, to reduce the risk of transmission and virus. We realized that even in that short time period, behaviors could really nullify the effort to do that testing. So we, we certainly understood that those individuals living in close quarters, those that have been close activities with where their masks might be off, they clearly needed to have that re-entry testing process done. And consequently, those going back in the dorms 
athletes and bands and choir, they fit into that category for testing. We also realized with the fact that we reduced the re-entry test number and that the Sentinel testing process, we realized need to be modified. And um, we appreciated the participation. We valued the data we got, but realized that we probably need and could improve upon that process. So the so-called active Sentinel testing gives us the ability to offer a greater uh, access to testing to the campus, particularly for those individuals who are either in close contact or who are a part of the general population that are concerned in part about the, the exposure they may have had. And the ability to offer the testing every other week um, is one that we're proud that we can for individuals who have concerns about their exposure and to clarify their overall risk status. So um, the plan that we have is more robust. So we're doing more testing than we did last year. It's just reformatted in a manner that gives us data, information, and we believe provides better opportunities for our students and our staff and employees to actually protect themselves and others who they may encounter. The, the environment we're in has been a challenge. I think most of you know that um, the numbers we faced have been uh, a bit overwhelming. So in, in the world, nearly 100 million cases, well over 2 million deaths. And America does more than its fair share to contribute to that. America is only 5% of the world's global population, 7 billion people, 350 million Americans. We make up 25% of the world's cases we make up 20% of the world's deaths. So we have in some ways underperformed as a country and are still challenged by the number of hospital admissions and deaths that are occurring across our land. And so um, those things as President Watts and as everybody before said um, that we still need to be vigilant. Although there is a vaccine that's, uh, vaccines are, are coming forward the risk of people getting infected is still very high. So the behaviors that we had with the level of intensity in the fall, we still need to continue. In Alabama, uh, we are um, continually struggling with numbers that are significant. Um, we're well over 400,000 cases, 6,000 deaths. A positivity rate hit numbers that we'd never seen before, approaching 40%. Fortunately, things are beginning to drop and Dr. Judd will speak about this in more detail, but our hospital admissions are finally going down. We, during the May sort of through August surge, we may have had 60 to 70 patients in the hospital with COVID. We've had close to 300 patients in our hospital with uh, COVID-19 infections. But gradually we're below 300 down around 260 and so the curves of admissions are dropping because one, we've learned how to take care of these patients better. We have some improved therapies, particularly monoclonal antibodies that keep people out of the hospital. And our doctors are working ever so hard. And people, I will tell you the governor's mask order uh, has been a tremendous blessing for the state because I think we would be much worse in a much worse condition if we didn't have it. So that persists and that's important. The other aspect of this is that you've heard, and there's certainly a tremendous amount of interest in the vaccine. And, and as I mentioned, we have some improved therapy uh, and UAB has been a big part of delivering these monoclonal antibodies to our citizens here and then across the state. We are part of developing remdesivir and have had been involved in almost all of the trials of new drugs um, and have been part of the definitive studies that showed certain drugs that don't work and have been a part of the vaccine trials. And in all of that, we don't have anything that speaks of 90% efficacy. But both of these vaccines, which are, is mRNA technology, uh, have demonstrated a tremendous amount of effectiveness. Uh, we, we used all of our prior learnings with the previous SARS coronavirus we knew that the spike protein was a critical part of being able to neutralize the virus as well as its infectivity. So we had that head start. So uh, within about 10 days after the first case of coronavirus, the Chinese government 
released the sequence of the virus. Within a week after the sequence was, was released, the NIH and Moderna and Pfizer established an mRNA vaccine and put it in the animals. We soon after about four or five weeks looking for effect in animals moved to phase one trials. Um, and then we're able to stagger those trials in a manner that they overlapped and quickly got to phase three trials. The reason it took several years for these trials to be uh, finished was because it took several years to get 30,000 people to roll, enroll. This time it took less than three months to get 30,000 people to enroll. And because there was so much infectivity going on, we were able to clearly to see a signal and a difference in the effect of the vaccines. And so in the Pfizer vaccine, for example, 100, nearly 170 people out of 20,000 got the coronavirus and nearly 30 to 40% of them ended up going to the hospital. In the case of those who got the vaccine, less than about 10 to 20 actually got infections and none of them actually went to the hospital. So around 11 actually got infected um, and none went to the hospital. And in those patients who were African-American, there were 2,000 who got vaccines and 2,000 who were placebos. Not a single African-American got infected who got the vaccine. So it is appeared to be significantly infective, I mean, protective. It takes two weeks, though, to get adequate antibodies to be protected. Now, the thing that everybody asks is, when are we getting it? And God knows, I wish we could give it to everybody tomorrow. We're limited by production. The demand has gone up and skyrocketed, but the production has been flat. And so we have worked hard to try to get through the prescribed list of people who are to get it. And the phases are 1A are those who are frontline healthcare workers and long-term care facility individuals. Phase B is this so-called essential workers, which is a bit of a catch-all. It includes educators, frontline workers, it, which are related to um, first responders, firemen, those in agriculture, policemen. It includes a lot of people, um, but we're not even to that group yet. We are to the group of 75 and older, and we're able to start vaccinating them. And our limitation is vaccine, is vaccine doses. So we've had We've vaccinated 24,000 people. Um, about 7,000 people have gotten both doses of the vaccine. So the vaccine requires uh, an initial dose and then 21 days if it's Pfizer and 28 days later, you need a second dose. And we've uh, done about 14,000 initial doses. So um, we're working our way through the list. I would hope uh, by the end of first quarter, which is mean April, May, that we would be talking, if not early, about student vaccines. The reality is it's an unknown answer to be accurate because we don't know if the production will change um, and the volume of vaccine that we will have could allow us to move faster. But unfortunately, right now, I couldn't predict that that's going to be the case. So you may have heard places where students and faculty have gotten vaccinated and that's been frustrating and disappointing when others have gone outside of the CDC recommendations and the Alabama Department of Public Health recommendations. And we are going to try to adhere to those rules as much as we can, but we're gonna do all we can to be efficient. We can vaccinate over a thousand people a day uh, just on our site for our campus and can do a, probably another thousand or 1200 once we move to an off-campus site for our community as we uh, um, uh, stand up our vaccination sites going forward. Uh, so thank you. Uh, I'll turn this over to Dr. Judd to give you more information about the virus and its behavior. Thank you for that, Dr. Vickers. So one of the things I wanna to talk to you tonight about is how the cases impact hospitalizations in Alabama. And we're gonna take a look at a slide that we use to really look at the data that we've had in Alabama um, to see when we see peaks, uh, what contributes to the peaks that we see. And what you'll see in this graph are uh, cases that we actually saw, daily cases, and then also daily hospitalizations. Uh, the cases are in black and the hospitalizations are in orange. 
toward the right side of the graph, it becomes a dashed line in orange and a dashed line in gray. Those are estimated cases and hospitalizations based on projections. And what we really saw here in the state, we saw this first big surge that hit right after Memorial Day and continued on through about the 4th of July when the governor issued a mask mandate on July the 16th that really helped to stem that particular surge and bring it back down. We then saw a bump up uh, right around the end of, of August when the university started back up again and when K-12 uh, restarted in-person instruction. The good thing about this particular bump is that you can see when it was primarily in the younger folks, there was not a lot of spread outside. And I think that's partially the behavior of young folks not taking the virus back home to older family members. So that's going to be important as you continue um, in this semester. Make sure that you're practicing good behaviors. If you know you've been in a situation where you could have been potentially exposed, that's not a time to go home to your family and risk exposing additional people. The next big surge hit after Halloween, and you see what happens with uh, Halloween, Thanksgiving, and Christmas as we see surges after all four of those holidays. That's one of the reasons we felt it was a good idea to not have uh, spring break this year, uh, because we know that cases surge after spring break of uh, cases of influenza surge after spring break. So this is a good time for us to, to stay together, to maintain the same social groups that we maintain when we're um, on campus and to keep the virus contained. We've got really positive signs right now. The cases are dropping pretty rapidly in the state in the last week, which is what we would have predicted uh, based on the fact that uh, New Year's Eve was on January 31st, December 31st, and then about 10 days later, we would expect to see a peak in the cases. And that's what we've observed here in Alabama. Hospitalizations are decreasing, cases are decreasing, and so we're very hopeful this trend continues. However, we're still at about 3,000 cases a day, and that's a really high number. You can see that's much higher than any other time that you've been here on campus. So we have to be extremely diligent with the behaviors outside of the classroom. Um, when you're in social situations, make sure you have your mask, make sure that you are limiting yourself to people that you have, um, that you're living with, that you are regularly um, socializing with. We don't want to have large groups uh, until we can get this number much, much, much lower. Uh, but hopefully, if all goes well, we'll continue on this path. And by about the end of March, we will be back down under 1,000 cases a day and well under 1,000 hospitalizations a day, which will provide some needed relief for the um, healthcare workers. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Fairclaw. Thank you, Dr. Judd. Good afternoon and, and welcome. I'm Mike Fairclaw, the Medical and Lab Director for Student Health Services. The institution has an immunization policy and requirement with the goal of providing a safe and healthy environment for all students, faculty, staff, and visitors. These recommendations are informed by and align with the evidence-based recommendations of the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, Centers for Disease Control, American College Health Association, and the Alabama and Jefferson County Health Departments. These immunizations have always been an important part of campus health and safety, and even in this time of a COVID pandemic, remain so. Currently, students with a registration status of hybrid are required to comply. Those who are remote and are athletes, residential students, or an otherwise required student group or are local also are required to comply. If you're remote, and not in a required student group and not local, you're exempt. And those in online only Q code classes are also exempt. The specific requirements are based on your status as non-clinical, clinical, or international. To view your particular set of requirements, please visit the Student Health Immunization webpage at www.uab.edu forward slash student immunizations and follow the outline directions. Documentation of the required immunizations and in some cases documentation of titers through blood work is required. Either official medical documentation, certificates of immunization such as a blue form uh, or positive titers. Student health does provide all the required vaccines and TB testing if needed. 
on a fee for service basis and this is charged to your insurance. So please either visit your patient portal under appointments and immunizations to schedule an innovation visit or call 205-934-3580 to schedule an appointment. You may also choose to receive these at your local health department or a private physician office. If you receive it through doc, uh, student health services, the documentation is automated. If you receive these at an outside entity, please upload the documentation via the patient portal under immunizations. If you have any questions or you need assistance, please either call the medical clearance department at 205-975-7751 or via your patient portal. Thank you so much. And I'm gonna turn it over to Alice Kim. Thank you so much, Dr. Faircloth and everyone else for the, all those updates and information. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Alice Kim and I'm the Vice President of Student Services for the Undergraduate Student Government. And I'm really excited to share with you all one of the most exciting additions to come to campus this year. And that is the Be Well UAB mobile app. Um, this officially launched yesterday, available on iOS and Android devices for those who are part of our beta testing phase. Now, back when the pandemic first hit, no one could have really predicted the toll that it would take on our health, both mental and physical, not to mention the added stress of each COVID case surge, these acts of racial injustice and just general political unrest throughout the year. And having been involved in mental health efforts on campus these past four years, I wanted the most accessible and effective way of promote, promoting all of the resources that UAB is constantly adding to support student wellness, specifically through a user-friendly mobile app that's cohesive to all things promoting wellness at UAB. And thanks to the support of doctors Angela Stowe, John Jones, Kurt Carver, and so many other of the admin and developers working around the clock behind the scenes, I'm happy to say that this initiative has come to fruition. Now, a brief overview of some of its functions are, is that it provides some ideas for daily wellness habits and it checks in through some tailored notifications and other features such as a daily checklist of self-help activities, guided meditation techniques, and so much more that we've received through student input. One of my favorite features about the app is the Get Involved tab, which has live updates and it syncs with um, Engage. And it has all of the wellness related events on campus, such as resilience seminars, AA and other recovery meetings, guided meditation, um, group exercise tech classes, and so much more. And just because we're in a hybrid format doesn't mean that these events aren't happening in a safe and socially distanced way. So this app, like I said, it syncs to Engage and the University Recreation app. So students, if you hear of any kind of event that you think pertains to mental health that isn't on the app, please let us know and we can get them connected and registered on Engage. And as for how to download it, this the current test flight build version um, represents our initial phase one release. And we are in the final review process with Apple to publish it to the App Store within the next week. And with that, I'll pass it on to Jasmine Benjamin for some closing remarks. Thanks, Alice. Um, so my name is Jasmine Benjamin. I'm the president of the Graduate Student Government. And I'll echo a lot of Tyler's remarks at the beginning of this webinar with a bent, of course, toward our graduate and professional students. So welcome to the spring semester, whether it's your first time or whether you've been here before. I'm very happy to have you, very happy to see everyone back on campus. Many of us that are in research and clinical work probably didn't get very much of a break over the holidays, uh, but I hope that all of our students were able to take some time to decompress, especially after everything that's happened in the past 12 plus months. We did really well last semester in terms of preventing the spread of COVID-19 on our campus, and we absolutely have to keep that momentum going during the spring and hopefully uh, not too much long after. We have to continue to show our blazer spirit by utilizing health promoting behaviors, um, things that we've heard time and time again, washing your hands, wearing a mask, staying a safe distance away from those that aren't in your quarantine pod. As students, we also have to continue using our health check. So I do know that some students that took a break away from campus kind of uh, checked out of health check for a little bit. Please do uh, re realign yourself with that. Uh, I 
think it's really easy to get those text messages once a day and respond very quickly, yes or no. Um, so continue to use your health check and definitely do continue to take advantage of Sentinel testing. As Dr. Vickers mentioned, vaccine rollout has begun on campus and I'm really excited for those that have already gotten the vaccine as well as for our students and hopefully the greater Birmingham community that will, can, that will have the opportunity to get the vaccine throughout the rest of the semester and the year. I definitely do urge all of our students, faculty and staff who are offered the opportunity to get the vaccine to take advantage of it. Um, there's a lot of speculation as Dr. Vickers touched on about whether or not the vaccine works. And I think that either way, it goes a long way toward protecting yourself and those around you from spreading or contracting the virus. Um, also, it's really just a testament to the incredible power of science and scientific research. And so if you have the time, I definitely do urge you to take a look at some of the faces and the labs behind the development of the vaccine. It's really an incredible, incredible feat. So on behalf of graduate student government, I wish all of our students, faculty and staff the absolute best for the upcoming semester. Please be safe, be smart, and thank you for joining us tonight. So I'll pass it on to Dr. John Jones now for his closing remarks. All right, thank you, Jasmine. Good evening, Blazers, and welcome back. On behalf of the campus leadership and the Division of Student Affairs, I bring you greetings. If, you, if we haven't met already, my name is John Jones and I serve as the Vice President for Student Affairs. I hope you all had a restful and restorative break. With one semester completed, we look forward to having a successful spring semester with the possibility of an in-person commencement ceremony. As you have seen from the information shared this evening and under the leadership of Dr. Watts, UAB is committed to excellence, accountability, and student success in providing the highest level of a safe campus environment. Although in-person programs have been suspended the first four weeks of the semester, we are still planning for and supporting in-person events this spring. In fact, we have over 40 in-person events scheduled to take place after February 14th, providing that our experts give us the green light. In regards to the programming for the rest of the spring semester, we will continue to provide programming that embraces and observes the safety practices and protocols as advised by the UAB experts. We will continue to use data to get, um, gather from student surveys, focus groups, town hall discussions like this, and other meetings to inform our programmatic offering. And lastly, as always, we are focused on the success of our students especially during this difficult time. We strive to provide appropriate safe outlets that allow students to de-stress and take breaks from the rigors of study. In closing, we are excited that you are back. I look forward to continue to work with the experts in this town hall and at UAB in providing a healthy and safe campus environment, facilitating students achieving the best version of yourself. Please continue the proper masking, the social distancing, the hand washing, and other critical health and safety behaviors, both on and off campus, in order to protect the entire community. So with that said, go Blazers. Wonderful, thank you so much. All right, so we're gonna open it up for some questions. If you have a question for any of our panelists um, in the room, we're happy to, to answer them. Um, you can just drop it in the Q&A section. Um, some of you did submit some questions beforehand, so I'm gonna turn to, the, to that list. Um, there, we had lots of questions coming in uh, about dining, and so I just wanted to give Mark Booker a chance to maybe address some of those questions. A lot of people wanting to understand the pricing around meal plans, um, considering that we kind of have hybrid and remote schedules. So, Mark. Thanks, Rosie. Some of those specific questions related to our dining fee for the Dragon Cash, and so um, we've talked with our um, administration and leadership and decided that for uh, similar to the fall, we will be offering a credit to those students who are completely remote based on their registered courses. Um, and th those credits will begin being reflected on their accounts beginning early next week. Uh, it'll take some time to verify that through uh, the registrar and the uh, registration process. But once those are verified for those students who will not be on campus, 
um, during the spring semester, those dining fee dollars will be credited back to their account. Um, one of the other questions that came up in the chat earlier uh, was in reference to whether WOW Cafe would be open. And at this time, we're not anticipating opening the WOW Cafe for the spring, but stay tuned for um, future um, hours of operation for the WOW Cafe going forward. Wonderful, thank you. Um, we had a question that came in, and Katie, I'm thinking this might be for you or, um, um, or Dr. Faircloth. So are all COVID-19 tests free for students, even if done at student health through an appointment? And do we call student health to get the test scheduled? Thanks, Rosie. This is Katie. Uh, there's a multi-pronged question there. Let me tackle part of it and then I'll ask Dr. Faircloth to chime in. So in terms of testing supported by the GuideSafe program, yes, all of that COVID testing is free to students. In relationship to those services provided by Student Health Services, let me turn it over to Dr. Faircloth. Yes, so currently all COVID tests are free through Verily or through Student Health. If you're symptomatic and you need testing, um, please um, contact Student Health after you filled out. And if you fill out your health check with those symptoms, you should recall, get a call from us anyway. Uh, if you don't uh, that same day, please give us a call. Uh, if you've been exposed uh, or, or want to test for any other reason, a lot of that, as uh, everyone talked about earlier, a lot of folks is gonna go through the guide safe barely process. But if you end up being frustrated and, and, and are unsure what to do, you can always call student health. But all COVID testing right now is free. One additional, uh, sorry, Dr. Faircloth. One additional resource, Rosie, I might point out to students is the Guideway uh, Call Center, uh, which offers a wealth of information based on uh, student and employee questions. And the information for that call center is available on the UAB United website. Great, we can also drop that in chat for everybody. So an individual, Natalie asks, will the study rooms in Blazer Hall be reopened? Students need a place to study, sometimes late at night and especially considering close quarters with roommates. Please consider reopening them. So I'll pass it over to Mark. Thanks for the question, Natalie. Uh, at this time, again, based on the advice of our experts on campus and in the, in the uh, city and county, we anticipate keeping those closed until such time that it's safe for us to reopen where students three, four, five gather in those um, small locations. Um, in spite of those being alternate um, sites for you to study, they are small and cramped. And so we wanna do everything we can to promote um, safety for our resident students. But once we get the clear, all clear and go ahead, we'll definitely take that under advisement and. Uh, consider reopening those spaces. Okay, this was a question that was sent in um, prior to the town hall. A student asked, with the anticipated surge in COVID cases in the next few weeks and associated strain on area hospitals and healthcare providers, will students taking hybrid or face-to-face -face courses be given an option to participate fully remotely for the first few weeks like UA students have been given? So I'll pass that to Dr. Benoit. So the circumstances are pretty different at UA than they are at UAB. Uh, you probably saw the news coverage after they won the national championship and there were thousands of students in the streets. Um, most of them were not masked. And that I think drove a lot of the decision-making around uh, pushing those courses toward a remote kind of format for the first couple of weeks of the semester. So we, we constantly monitor the uh, situation and and we are feel very confident right now that we can start in the format that we've set aside to have in-person hybrid remote and online courses available to our students if things change we'll certainly notify uh, students and faculty of that change but currently we're not anticipating needing to move in that direction I do want to make one other point I meant to make earlier which is um, a lot of what we're doing is based on the kind of course that you're scheduled for. So if you have courses in the uh, schedule that are uh, hybrid or in-person classes, it doesn't really matter if you've made an arrangement with a faculty member not to come to class. The expectation is still that you will do your daily health check, that you will be in compliance 
um, in terms of doing your educational module, which is mandatory for all students this semester, and also that you'll participate in active Sentinel testing. There's no way that we can monitor and keep track of any individual arrangements that have been made. So your schedule really determines what uh, you're expected to do on campus. Thank you. We've had several students want to know, is the COVID vaccine going to be made mandatory? I'm not sure who might be the best. Dr. Vickers? So th this vaccine was approved under a emergency use authorization. And most of our legal and general counsel has said that you cannot mandate a, um, a therapy that had not had full FDA approval. So it, it will not be mandated. And then a follow-up, we've had several students who um, identify as international students and they're wanting to know if they will have access to the vaccine when it's made available to UAP students. You know, as far as I, if, if they're a part of our student body, I would think they would. I don't yes, think they would. all UAB students will yeah. have access when we get to that point in time. It won't matter whether or not you're an international or a domestic student. Yep. Um, will the COVID vaccine be made available through student health? <laughs> Dr. Faircloth. Yeah, so we're, we're working with campus partners and, and leadership planning for vaccination probably mid to late spring, depending on the availability from the ADPH uh, and um, permission from Jefferson County to move to phase two. Um, the specifics of when, where, how, and the sequencing are part of that planning. And so there's more to come, hopefully very soon. Um, student health will be involved in it, but we need a space that's large enough that we can uh, do it safely. So it will likely will not be inside student health, but will be somewhere on this on the UAB campus. We've had several students just talk about financial strain. Um, what is UAB doing to help students with financial strain? Dr. Benoit? So fortunately, we had an infusion in the fall semester of funds that came from the federal government and recently received another infusion of funds um, that will that eligible students will have access to in student affairs. They also had a separate fund that was set up to help students who had financial need. And in addition, we provided other kinds of resources to students like if you uh, had a Chromebook and you needed a laptop. We still have laptops available for students who need to uh, have a loaner laptop in order to be able to do their schoolwork. So there are a variety of different kinds of resources that we have provided in addition to the usual resources of uh, grants, Pell Grants, as well as financial aid. We've had several questions about study spaces. One was said, with the former education building being demolished, will, will another safe study space be open? So I don't know if um, Dr. McMahon wants to answer a question about study spaces and uh, Dr. Carver's team I know has made a, uh, a website that can show study spaces, so. Sure, I'll address that. Hi everyone, I'm Lori McMahon. So the Education Building and Bartow Arena were extra spaces that we made available for the fall so that students would have uh, enough space to study and be safely socially distanced. And when we looked at the data, those spaces were not used in the fall. There was ample space in Stern Library, in Hill Center, and in Lister Hill Library. So those are the spaces that are available for students in the spring. But of course, we will monitor uh, space needs and we will make adjustments if we see that there are spaces that are needed for students. But right now, Bartow Arena and the education building, the old education building, are not being used. Great, thank you. Um, does Dragon Cash work the same as Laser Bucks in order to get dining options? Mark? I was just typing my answer to that question. Um, it does uh, to a degree. Laser Bucks can be used at select vendors off campus. Dragon Cash can only be used on campus. So if you've got Blazer Bucks, you've got several options in the community where you can use Blazer Bucks um, to pay for things. And if you've got Dragon Cash, it's only available for dining on campus. So they're similar, but not exactly the same. And thanks for your question. Right, we've had a, a student asking about just uh, lab classes, if there are um, some of them are online, wanting to understand the rationale of lab fees. So I will pass that to Dr. Benoit. 
Sure. So if you think about the, what goes into putting together a lab class, a lot of the uh, actual uh, pieces that contribute to the financial uh, part of lab classes are the individuals who prepare the labs, the individuals who figure out which labs to offer during the semester. So the major part of the lab fees are actually covering person costs, not uh, materials. Okay. All right. Let me see what else is coming in. I actually think we have covered most of the topics that have been submitted. So at this point, we are kind of near the end of the hour. So I'd like to pass it to Dr. Benoit and Dr. Watts for some wrap up comments. Dr. Benoit. Sure. So I just wanna say, I think you hear from what we've talked about today that we, we are so glad to have you back on campus. We want to have another safe semester. We are incredibly proud of what you were able to do in the fall. And we know you'll continue that into the spring as well. So have a great semester and we, we have your backs. We know you have ours as well. We're all again in this together and we will round the curve. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Benoit. And I echo those comments. We're so glad to have you back engaged in the spring semester and we're gonna do everything we can to help you be successful. And I think you've heard from all the folks who talked tonight that we leave no stone unturned and we will use science and evidence-based approaches to making our decisions on behalf of the safety of the UAB community. And as you know, or should know, UAB Medicine, UAB Health System, the School of Medicine, School of Public Health are all playing vital roles in helping Alabama be the best that it can be in the midst of this pandemic. Thank you very much. Have a good evening and have a great semester. Look forward to seeing you. Bye-bye. Good evening. Thank you.